Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are two authors, Annie Corzin and Nancy Cook de Herrera. Naturally, they both multitask, so stay tuned. <laughs> Author, comedy writer, performer, Annie Corzin was born and raised in the Bronx and went to Bard College. After spending a good part of her life in New York, where she raised her daughter on the Upper West Side, she moved to Los Angeles. You've read her essays in the LA and New York Times. You've heard her commentaries on National Public Radio. You've seen her in a recurring role on Seinfeld, as well as many other TV series. Annie has performed a solo show, Yenta Unplugged, and another one, Keep Your Mouth Shut where she refers to herself as Bargain Junkie, the, which is the name of her book, and the title, the subtitle is Living the Good Life on the Cheap. Um, why would I think that the Yenta is a good <laughs> label for you? <laughs> why would I think that? <laughs> I think it is in a, in a positive way. It has negative connotations, but I think I'm earthy and nurturing and motherly and full of life and full of curiosity and I think the bargain aspect um, could also be said to be true of Yentas. What about, we like a good deal. <laughs> and then what about, do you get in trouble with your comments? <laughs> Not really. I mean sometimes people say, well why are you so proud of being cheap? And <laughs> I'm not cheap, I'm frugal. Cheap is a rich person who's a bad tipper. You know, that's cheap, that's nasty. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, that, yeah. I'm just, I've been forced to be frugal because the things I do, like acting and writing and performing, are things that are very unreliable. So we have, my husband and I have long periods of unemployment. And we know and, how to do something on know, the cheap. Or actually, no, not on the cheap, but like bargain, bre uh, budgeting. Exactly. And making things work. Exactly. But, I mean, I, I want all the things that everybody in this country wants, every middle class person. I want a nice home and surrounded by beautiful objects and nice clothing. I want to travel and I want to go to restaurants. And I do all of that without spending money. You went to Bard. Yes. Was there a drama school at that time? There was. And I Because now it's better, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I participated. I, but I started, what was I? I was an English major I, and I ended up being a music major as a pianist. Oh, you did? So when I do oh. my shows, I, I play my own, my own stuff. But oh, the that's thing is, great. What, what, I, what I talk about in the book is somebody like me who's done a lot of things, okay? And I can, I have a lot of skills. I don't have a lot of money. So what I have to do is find a way to use my skills for income. Okay. And you talked about multitasking, and that's what I do. Yeah, multitasking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and bargain junkie. But I love, like, your, one of the words is frugalista. Yes, I call myself a frugalista. That's fantastic. And yeah. also a thriftaholic. Well, look, we were talking before about jewelry. I've been collecting Bakelite for years. I started buying it when nobody knew what it was. I just love it. Ten this cents? Is some of it, yeah. <laughs> so I spent a couple of dollars for these pieces, which are quite a bit more valuable now. My top is Chico's. A lot of older women oh. like Chico's. I like Chico's. This was on sale. The thrift shop that I go to has dollar Sundays. So I got this for a dollar. So they still do that? You can yeah. still find bargains? Absolutely. But not Bakelite. These, pa these pants are wrapped around. <laughs> Bakelite is harder, but I still occasionally do. Do you? Because and you had to have bought that years and years absolutely. ago. Absolutely, yeah, years ago. But what I discovered, the odd thing about Bakelite is if you buy it on eBay, uh, you can get some good deals. Really? I'm actually surprised. I went on eBay to sell stuff, but it, I, the prices were so low, I ended up buying instead of selling. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, so you you still hunt the thrift shops, the Absolutely. Goodwill, the, the, the thrift shops, and the yard sales and estate sales, especially in LA. LA is a disposable society. Is it easier in LA? Much I would think easier. New York was easier. No, no, those... because people don't have garages. Oh, they don't have garage see, sales. They do in Brooklyn. They have stoop sales. You know, yeah, stoop because, sales yeah. and tag but sales. But not in Manhattan. Uh, but in L.A., people buy things and they get rid of them or they move into a place and they move out. So every week of the year, people are getting rid of stuff. And I take advantage of okay, that. Okay, you're talking. You're talk, 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 talk. You do a show. You've done solo shows. Mm -hmm. Why would you write a book where you can't talk? Oh. <laughs> well, writing a book, I'm talking now. <laughs> and writing a book is talking at the computer. But actually, it's funny you should say that because I do try to keep my style chatty and personal and I tell stories I and mean, I'll is. tell you a story a bargain story I had to go to a bridal shower I hate bridal showers because you sit there and you they, you watch the bride open a coffee maker and an ice cream maker and a waffle iron the presents are boring and expensive and have no imagination and no future value what I did was <laughs> I collect I collect a lot of things I collect um, vintage textiles Vintage oh, hankies. Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. So I have these Victorian white on white lace hankies, which were called originally wedding hankies. And I took out about a dozen of these. I washed them, I bleached them, I ironed them. Now I only paid a quarter each for these. But I had the dozen, I put them in a gift basket, I brought them to the shower, and I said to the bride, These are for the women in your wedding party. Oh, how well, lovely. Well, she loved it. Everyone, I could see that your expression. I know, it's you great. Know, it was original, it was thoughtful, it was cheap, and beautiful. believe me, it was worth more than any of the coffee makers. I know, but it was beautiful. And it was beautiful. So I felt it was something from the heart that I, it gave me pleasure to give, and that didn't cost anything. But you had a dozen of them that you could get rid of? Well, I buy, I accumulate, I'm, okay. I'm saying, I, my, my house is filled to the raft. Where do you keep everything? All the over, and then twice a year I have a huge sale. Oh, you do too? Of, yes, and the dealers come to my sale. The dealers line up at seven in the morning for my sale. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. So, yeah. In, in the book, what's your mantra? My mantra is, Think beyond the box. Think outside of the ah, box. Be inventive. Reinvent yourself. And it never, you know, it never hurts to ask. My brother-in-law went to, we were in Italy, and my brother-in-law, who's Danish, went to a very, very high-end eyeglass place. He needed new sunglasses. And he, in a very civil, polite way, he bargained. And he got $100 off the price. So I you mean, can you do can it do anywhere. That. Not in Bloomingdale's. Well, you, know, you could try. But in, <laughs> <laughs> but in a store, in a, in a hotel, you could say, I, it's off season. I see you don't have a lot. I'm bringing yeah. a family reunion. Can you give right, us a break? Can right. you, you know. Do you help the wealthy, the wealthy, find a thrifty way to live, or do they care? You know, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of them won't, because wealthy people, and I can't say I blame them, they don't want something that's used. They uh -huh. don't want a second hand thing. But I have sometimes gotten calls from wealthy people who are saying, can you find me a such and such? Can you a get me a like deal on, specific, a, on yeah. a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you hang out with a lot of celebrities. Is yeah, it because of your husband's work? I think it's because we're fun and charming people. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, I have a lot of rich and famous friends. And I have to reciprocate. And I can't reciprocate when they invite me to a fancy restaurant or take us on a cruise. I can't reciprocate in kind, but I can do something else. And what I often do is I take wealthy friends out to dinner at obscure ethnic restaurants, oh, that's cool. which are authentic and fun and real and incredibly cheap. So I can be generous. I can take a group out. It's not going to break the bank. And they appreciate it. But it also shows that you've gone and you've looked for it. And you've that I've selected the perfect the place. made effort. And yeah. they appreciate it. And, and we're talking about people like Patricia Heaton and Max von Sydow. Yeah. And, yes. And on and on. Drop some names. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> Robert J. Was the, was the head of New Line Cinema. He produced all, all right. the... Um, the Lord of the Rings movies, right. and he came over for dinner, and he goes to lots of very fancy dinners. We just had potato pancakes and leftover turkey salad, but it was a fun evening. We played games. We go way back. We talked about old times. He told us 
He had never spent an evening, a whole evening together. He usually goes from one party to another. This was oh, the first right. time he stayed all night because it was so. Yeah. But I just provided fun, nothing fancy, but fun. But that reminds me, telling, saying this yeah. little simple dinner yeah. about the the producer from Tokyo. <laughs> I love that Japanese in the book. Thing. You know, I forgot that Japanese in the culture, they don't eat leftovers. It's got to be fresh, freshly bought, freshly made, and that's it. And I forgot about that and invited our producer friend over, and I had made a pot roast deliberately the night before sure, so it's because like it's better. And he was hanging out in the kitchen. He saw me taking this pot out of the stove and put, out of the fridge and putting it on the stove. He said, Annie son. Are you serving garbage? Garbage. <laughs> garbage. He thought it was, to him it was garbage. You know, so. I think that's such a great story. There's so many stories like that in the book. And how do you collect I these hope so. Just by living. <laughs> <laughs> Just by living. Tell us a little bit uh, about the night your husband, who is an Oscar winner, Went to the awards and what well, he was wearing. This will be our final. He, Tell us his my name. husband was wearing a brand new for him, brand new suede blazer. And the first thing he did at the party was dip his sleeve into <laughs> tomato soup. And I said, Benny, don't worry about it. I got it at a thrift shop for a dollar. He didn't <laughs> I can even get know. you another one. Yes, he doesn't shop. I just put things in his. So closet. tell us his name and what the film was. Benny Corson, that was Babette's Feast, actually. And Babette's Feast, yeah. yeah. Now he just so there he was. He has one coming out, Forever Plaid, oh. based on the show Forever Plaid. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, years ago, I interviewed all those plaid boys. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, no, yes, 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 he's yeah, become yeah. a plaid boy. Yeah, well, all those plaid boys. Yeah. Now, you can be a plaid boy and find plaids for all those guys. That, uh, that's right. That's right. I did that, actually, for a, an opening that we did. I found plaid ties and blazers for, for a lot of... Well, I'm so happy you came on today I'm to thrilled. tell us. And also, there's so many lessons in the book. <laughs> yeah. love, and it's really easy reading. Yes, they did so, a good job. Uh, I like their... The bargain movie. Junkie. That's it. And I have a blog, thebargainjunkie.com. Oh, you do? <laughs> thebargainjunkie.com. Well, we need to know what you're talking about. Thanks, Annie. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Pleasure being here. And don't go away, because we'll be right back with Nancy D. Herrera. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. San Francisco-born author Nancy Cook <laughs> de Herrera attended Stanford University before leaving her Bay Area home to marry into a famous missionary family in Hawaii. She's had adventures from the United States to Europe to South America to Sub-Sahara and back to Los Angeles, where she now lives in the Hollywood Hills. She tells one story after another in her book, Never Tango with a Stranger. <laughs> Nancy has been involved with fashion, high society, and spiritual meditation. Her love affair with India, where she became a pioneer of the spiritual movement, led to a interesting, interesting <laughs> connection in the music world. <laughs> Rockers. <laughs> When I went to visit her in Hollywood Hills, she had to, to put me in between uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers <laughs> and someone else. And I was going like, what are these people doing at her house? It was also out of keeping for this woman that I had met during her high society phase. <laughs> All You Need Is Love is the name of her other book because you remember the Beatles, so maybe that all came around. I don't know. She'll tell us about it. So where do we start? Let's start in Hawaii. Oh, well, I lived there. I lived there at a very interesting time because it was during World War II. Yeah, that's what I thought was. And, and I used to do, uh, when I was at Stanford, I majored in bacteriology, but I minored in speech and drama, oh, which you did. really helped. And then I did uh, uh, amateur theater all throughout during the war. But you, which, were, you were entertaining the, the, uh, the troops. Hi, the, troops. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the and, important admirals right. that came through. Well, it was wonderful because all the local women became the hostesses for Nimitz and Halsey, and then because the military wives had been sent home. Oh, is that they, what happened? They had to leave the islands. Oh, so when, so yeah. when they were there, yeah. you were part yeah. of what was it, the hosting? Yeah. We were supposedly with 
uh, with we saw a lot of, of Nimitz, especially. Such a lovely man. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, it's we're talking all parts of history with your life right. because we're going right. now to Paris. You right. left Hawaii. Things didn't work out. No. You had three sons. Yes. And you left Hawaii. You went to Paris for the first time in Europe. Right. And that was when I met my husband. His name was Luis, but the, he was he was uh, driving with the American team, so they all in Le Mans. So they, they were all in called Le Mans. him Louis. Yes. So that was that started our great love affair. And that's uh, what the book really right. tells about because right. I'm I've right. been reading it page after page. Oh, I'm delighted. <laughs> Well, what happens in the book Never Tango with a Stranger uh, is what put me on my spiritual path. Is that and how I, it started? Yes, his death. Oh, so from Paris you went to London. Well, um, I, I, you were, we were married. I lived in, we lived in Argentina. And then we came up for a trip once to the States, just, you know, a nice trip. Went up to Canada. Louis got so fed up with not even being able to have a glass of wine he said, come on, let's go back into the United States. Uh -huh. So we dropped back to, just to, uh, back into the United States. And one day we went to a place uh, uh, not far from, from uh, we were on our way to, uh, oh, what do you call it, Las Vegas. All right. So we stopped over and we went to Zion Canyon, which is so beautiful. And when we were coming out and I was driving the car, we were stopped on the, on the highway by three members of the army and asked us, what are you doing on this road? And I All said, right. we're on our way to Las Vegas. And they said, you don't know there's been an atomic fallout? We, there was no radio reception, so we didn't know. And then they put a Geiger counter on my foot and a needle went all the top and I said, well, what, what is that? And he said, it's a Geiger counter. And I said, well, what does it mean when that needle goes all the way? And he said, Oh, it means you're hot, lady. And I said, oh, thank you. And my husband said, I don't think this is supposed to be funny, Nancy. Hmm. But how little anybody knew. This was in 1952. And then uh, we went back to Argentina. And 18 months later, he died of, of the, uh, the, well, the man who was the head of the blood side of the world came into the case. Oh, the blood person, yeah. 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 And, and Louis had been the amateur golf champion of every South American country. You know, I, hadn't got, I haven't gotten that far in this story because I have you two having a marvelous life in Paris oh, yeah. and with the cream of the yeah. la creme in London yeah. and yeah. visiting with... Uh, Everything I mean, was wonderful. And then we had a daughter born. She was nine months old when he died. So you were back in South America. Yeah. You were in Argentina. Yeah. But his family was very influential in, his, in his, all over his, South America. His uncle was the, was the president of Uruguay yeah. and was the first one to declare war against Germany. So that was, that was right next door right. to yeah. Argentina. Same name exactly, Luis Alberto. Is that right? The yeah. same? Yeah. 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 And, and the rest of the family was in politics, banking. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then after his death, I stayed on for another year and a half. Oh, you did stay with the family well, then? Well, I was very happy. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I stayed because I was there during the revolution, which then threw Perón out, and we were all involved in it. But you, were, you talk about um, how you had to be so careful about saying anything about Perón, even though you oh. were like the chosen oh. families, right? But they were targets. Your families yeah, yeah. were. We, we, the, the, the oligarchs, as he called them, were the targets of wrath on the part of Perón. We moved out twice out of our uh, apartment and allowed some young people to come in with their machine guns to protect where we were because Perón had promised to burn that whole area. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, is that what finally brought you to Los Angeles again? Well, after, after, after Louis' death and then uh, now I have four children, but three of them are Americans, and, uh, right. and you know, it's really, uh, it's hard, I think, for a single woman to live in the Argentine. Is it? And, uh, because yes. of this old style of, uh, yes, of yes. mores. And and, and, and and they don't understand friendship with a man, with a woman, and 
I would never go out with anybody if I had stayed in the Argentine. And it, it was important for me to raise my children in the United States. So is that at the period when you became a fashion ambassador? Yes, yes. So that I supposedly was... won a, a, a contest. I was sort of led into it by Cobina Wright. Oh, right. And, I forgot. And it's just as well because it was a trip of 72 days, and both the PR man and Cabina got sick and went home, and I went on. Oh, is that what happened? Because Cabina Wright was, uh, she was, was one she of the columnists. Yes, yeah, she the, was one of the columnists. Was a columnist at the Examiner or yeah. the Herald, I That's don't right. remember. Yeah. And she was very influential because she had a very good marriage besides being a society woman and yeah. people always looked up to her. Oh, she'd been a, an opera star also. And, also. <laughs> and oh, it, she had an amazing background and she was the only private person invited to the wedding of Princess Elizabeth and 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 Prince the, the prince Philip. Right. Philip because he had really uh, been sort of engaged to her daughter. Oh, and is they that all, right? And then little Cobino got married to somebody else in the meantime, but he and, 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 and Cobino stayed great friends. He always wrote to her as dearest madre. That's why, that's why I thought your book was so interesting because you have all these side stories that you keep <laughs> telling, about, telling us about. Um, so you went on and did this fashion thing. Yes, I did it. Uh, and then I did it for about 12 years. Oh, you did. And I went as a guest of the government everywhere I went. Ah. And I did this costume, costumes and culture. And it was very good PR, so the, uh, the government foss supported me. It didn't pay me, but, but supported were, me. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. And then India came after that? Right. Okay. Yes. Tell yes. us about India. Here you are. It's, yeah. Is it the 60s? This is in the 60s. And, and the Beatles are there? And you're well, like hanging first of all, I, I went with a man named Tom Slick. You know, they're going to make a movie around him now. No. He was I a don't. very, very important uh, oil man from Texas who had the Mind Science Foundation. And he said, I know you're doing a, a very interesting uh, around the world trip. Why don't you stop over in India and join me and this other parapsychologist? Ah. You'll find a lot of things to talk about. I see. So, they were looking for supernatural things. I was looking for more knowledge about spirituality. And you learned that there and brought it back right. to the Hollywood Hills where you teach meditation. Yes. And yeah. why does a, a musician need meditation? Because, you know, I would say that 50% of all the rock and rollers that I teach have been into heroin or have been alcoholics. It's the tension. The tension kills them. Like, I know that you knew the hot chili peppers. Like, John Fuslicanti, when he came to me, was an absolute wreck. And, and just, what do you do? How do you, how do you calm them down? I teach them to meditate. I have to see them three times. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, and, and John, when he, he was the third time, we were standing in the sun by my front door, and, and this woman that he lived with then, we both looked at him, we said, my God, go look at yourself in the mirror. He'd had these deep sort of lines on his cheeks, and now they're all. He came to see me not oh, about two months ago. That's about the time when I was over there seeing you yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, and he looks like a different person. He's so happy with his meditation, and and so what do they do? The first thing that you teach him, you see him three times, and yeah. then you take him in the back room. Yep, into my bedroom. Into your bedroom, <laughs> <laughs> and you give him a. I give him a mantra. A mantra is a sound vibration that stimulates your uh, heart knowingness, it's your intuition. Uh -huh. Maharishi teaches that your intuition will never lead you astray where your intellect always can. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. the mantra brings out the... The, 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 the heart knowingness, your intuitive, intuitive knowingness. And it was interesting the other night I went to uh, this matrix that was shown at the uh, Egyptian theater uh -huh. and there were about eight people talking mainly in alternative medicine, and so much of it they stress is it's your heart that does the healing, not your mind. Is that right? Yeah. Well then, stress then is the killer, is because the killer. it's making your heart beat too fast, right? But stress is the killer. Originally, Maharishi said to me when he heard all the, all the things about our progress, he said, but their progress is killing them. And he said, I said, but Maharishi, everybody in the state seems to live with a lot of stress. 
And he said, how would they like to learn something that would make it so that stress never became de-stress? De-stress, right. And there it is. So, so by meditating, it slows down your heart. That's right. Your whole metabolism. Your whole thing. Yes. Yesterday, I taught a man who's a champion board skater. Oh. He showed us a little a, a thing to see at night. I just couldn't believe that anybody Oh, the energy that could they do have. What yeah, he yeah, does. it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And so, he, but he, they live under stress. Oh. Any, anyway, and also I've done some of the, the that, uh, that uh, she's the tattooer. Oh. Her name is uh, uh, Condi. Cat, Cat Condi. And when she came. She tattoos people? She does the tattooing. She does the tattooing. And she said that when she does tattooing, she's so close to them that a lot of the negativity from oh. them can come into her. Oh. And with meditation, it's like a shield. Your morning meditation sort of insulates you for the day. And then you're out, and people can't take as much of Joan away. And then at the end of the day, you, take, you have another 15, 20 minutes, and it's like taking a spiritual bath. Oh, that's fantastic. It is. You and have I, to learn. <laughs> I know. You've been so great to tell us, give us all this insight. Yeah. And we can see, like, from everything you've gone through has brought you to the, on this path, has right. brought you to this. Right. And now you can sit down and teach people yes. how to take yeah. care of themselves. And you know Donovan, the Scottish singer, he's coming in about two weeks. He and his wife always stay with me. And they're working with David Lynch like crazy oh, to get meditation taught in schools. Nancy, thank you so much for being with us well, today. Well, Joan, it seems so nice to see you. I haven't seen enough of you. We've known each other for, what, about 30 or 40 years. Maybe. A long time. <laughs> so it's, it's good great. to see you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Keep writing. J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at AOL.com and 777 South Figueroa. 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Mm -hmm.